Welcome back to Good Carpet Paddling. Today we're talking about energy systems and training zones. Here at Gig Harbor Paddling, we like to talk about zones. If I just tell a paddler to go do a workout, they might go super easy, they might go super hard, and so they need instruction on what part of the range to execute the workout at. So we start with zone one, then go to two, three, four, five. I'm gonna talk today about what those zones are in relation to the energy system, and then we'll talk about how to use that for your race strategy. Before we get into the individual zones, we're gonna talk about the energy systems of the body. So there's some people that'll add on a few systems and get super specific, but we're just gonna stick with the simple three. We have the phosphagen or the ATP BC system. We have the glycolysis or the anaerobic system. And then we have the aerobic and oxidative system. I'm just gonna quickly run through the way that we like to think of these systems. The first section right here, I'm talking about what fuels these systems. So ATP is this energy currency in our body. That's what makes your muscles move. That's how you're able to function is ATP. It's adenosine triphosphate. I'm not gonna get into the molecules and chemistry of all, but I just want you to understand that you have this storage of ATP that you can use up at any second, but it only lasts two to 10 seconds. You also have the glycolysis where you're using more of in your races, and that's gonna create more of the pain, that's gonna create more of the fitness level dependency, and it's because you're using carbohydrates, or in other words, glucose. Uh, aerobic is what you can do indefinitely because you're using oxygen, fats, carbs, storage like that. For the phosphagen system, I want you to think more explosive, the first part of your race, so the start, there's no waste. But when you get to glycolysis, the reason why you feel so much pain at the end of a race and because your muscles stop working and you feel like you're barely moving is because there's a lot of waste. There's byproducts because of using the glucose. And so you're gonna be creating pyruvate, this thing called NADH, lactic acid, which we all know about, but you're also creating ATP. And with the aerobic system, you only really are, uh, the byproducts are only CO2 and H2O. So you're gonna pee it out or you're gonna breathe it out. And then what we're gonna focus on mainly is the glycolysis system because that's really where we live, especially in our sport. In the canoe and kayak world, you're a 200 meter athlete, 500 meter athlete, and a 1,000 meter athlete specifically. Um, the 1,000 meter, you're going to create a little bit more crossover using the aerobic system. A good visual to just help you understand that you don't just execute one, or one system and then it shuts off and then you start the second system and it shuts off and then you go to the third. It's all kind of blending together and our body transfers back and forth as you exert different levels of energy. So this graph kind of helps you understand that the higher power you're demanding, um, which system is gonna last how long. So right here, this shows you that the ATP or the phosphagen system, it, it's starting high because it's already there. You don't have to develop it. It doesn't have to, have to ramp up. It's gonna be lasting you two to 10 seconds. This is what you were given when you were born. You're not gonna be able to develop this greater. It's just the storage that you were born with. Um, then the, you see though that even though you just started your race, for instance, and you're using that 10 seconds of free energy, that ATP, you're still generating the kickstart of the glycolytic, glycolytic system. And so this green line shows you, it's kind of blending in with the ATP PC system. Everyone gets twisted on that, don't worry. And you're gonna probably die off around two minutes if you're fit. Again, these are all ranges because it depends on your fitness level. But this is typically what a good athlete is gonna die off at is around two minutes. And then you can see that your aerobic system kind of has all, it's always there, it's always in the background, but you start depending on it a lot after that two minutes and it's indefinite, which means as long as you keep up fats and carbs in your body, which you all will have stores of, theoretically you could go on forever at that low pace. When you first start on our team, we don't necessarily go into these five zones because it's unnecessary, but we might ask you, hey, go paddle around the dock at a really easy zone or go just paddle easy. 
And then maybe you paddled for a couple months, like, hey, go around that piling, but go, go medium, go like 50%. And then maybe by the end of your development phase, we're going to say, all right, you're racing, go all out. And so you're just going as hard as you can in the boat. Easy, medium, hard. Everybody knows it. But we're going to get you a little bit more technical. So we're going to talk about our zones. Zones one through five. Zone one. You're going to be able to talk easy, breezy. Super conversational. You're basically going on a walk with your friends. So in the paddling world, that workout is going to be like a 60 minute recovery paddle. We're going to want to train this depending on the season of the year, uh, somewhere between two to three times a week. Your heart rate is going to be 35 to 45% of your max. Just so you guys know, the general way to find your maximum heart rate is 220 minus your age. Super general way to figure it out. Every athlete is going to be a little different. And the more fit you are, the higher your max heart rate might be able to be. So just so you know that, as I mentioned, the percentage of your heart rate. So zone two, it's going to be more broken sentences. Um, we're going to call this steady state. This is about 45 to 55% of your heart rate. Um, you're going to also want to be in this. I'm actually going to change this to maybe two times, one to two times. And this is more two to three times a week. Um, an example of this would be uh, what we call Sprinter's GA1. So every two minutes, you're going to do 20 power strokes. And this is for about 60 minutes of work. And so this is going to make it a little bit more working, but you could probably do this forever. Again, you're still in the aerobic oxidative section when, or system when we're talking about zone one and zone two. So zone three, you're probably going to be able to get two to three words out at a time if you're really in zone three. Uh, this is going to be considered the threshold. Everyone should be familiar with that pace. Um, slash now we're working. So threshold is going to talk about this beautiful transition into the pain cave, aka glycolysis, aka lactic acid. Um, and just so you guys know, lactic acid is actually not the reason why you're hurting. The lack of lactic acid is. So if you have a higher rate of lactic acid production, you're going to be able to take a lot of this waste and turn it into ATP. It's really the NADH that's causing you pain. So become a little bit more friendly with lactic acid. Maybe they'll help you out and you won't feel so painful as you step onto the threshold of zone three, four, which is glycolysis. So um, just talking about this step over. That's what threshold means. And sometimes people even talk about the lower threshold and the higher threshold, which we're going to reference a little bit between zone three and zone four. So going back to over here at the heart rate, there's going to be a little bit of a range here because this is where your fitness level really stands out. The fitter you are, the higher percentage you're able to hold for longer, the higher percentage of your heart rate. But if you're not very fit, the second you get up to 65%, you're like, I can't handle this more than five minutes when a fit person is going to be able to handle it for 50 minutes. So just bear with me as I give you these large ranges. Um, I believe in zone two, we left off around 55%. So it'd be 55 to 65%. I might have left off at 45. My point is, though, you're going to be around 60% of your maximum heart rate. The amount of times you want to train this, again, always depends on the time of year. Uh, as an example, we are in the start middle phase. Well, more like the start phase of doing more zone three work than any other work. So if you're doing, uh, if you're preparing for a race that's coming up in the spring, then by winter time, you want to be 
very familiar with threshold work, but if you push that threshold work closer to your sprint season, your body is not necessarily going to be in peak condition. So we can talk about when you want to be in these zones a little bit later, and it's all up to professional opinion. So I'm going to say um, for right now, I'd like to see this happening three times a week. An example of this workout is 2K um, at zone three, and you're only going to get 60 seconds of rest times eight, or a 1K with 45 seconds of rest times 10. So as you can see, you're not slacking off. You only get a little bit of time as a rest, and you're doing it repeatedly and so after a while, you might get tired. Moving on to zone four. This is going to be very difficult You're going to talk. This is where it's starting to get super difficult. You're breathing super hard. Um, upper threshold, you could call it, as a description. Your heart rate is going to be more 65 to 75%. Um, this creates a lot of fatigue, so I actually don't want you to do this too many times in the week. So I'm going to say more about two times a week. And again, this is for athletes that are practicing up to nine times a week on the water when I'm talking about how many times a week. If you only practice three or four times a week, a lot of these numbers are going to be off, but you can kind of get the gist as long as you keep in mind that this is for a very dedicated elite athlete kind of practice schedule. Um, an example of this kind of workout is going to be more about, I'd, I'm going to go off of the example I gave you before of a 2K. Um, maybe you get 75 seconds of rest because you're going harder. You're doing a higher intensity. So if you're going to last in a workout, you're going to need a little bit more rest, maybe not as much reps, and then you work up your resistance, and maybe eventually you'll be able to do eight quality reps. Um, an example of a zone four for this one would just be adding, oops, adding up to 60 seconds of rest times eight, and then eventually moving up to 10 reps of that. And lastly, we have zone five. So this is the max. And sometimes when you're in a 500 meter race, you're not actually going to get to your max heart rate, but your max effort level. So um, for training, though, we're going to say, I think we left off around 75%, that it's going to be around 80 to 100% of your max heart rate. Talking test, there is no talking. <laughs> Maybe after the race is over, you're able to say, good job, guys. Um, this is as hard as you can go. Again, 80 to 100% of your max heart rate. How often to train this? Man, if you are getting you're six to eight weeks out from your first race of the season or your big race of the season, then I would start adding it in maybe once every 10 days or something. Um, once a week or so. An example of this kind of workout is gonna be tapping in to this system, your phosphagen system. Um, this is gonna be 10 to 15 seconds as hard as you can. And then to recover that two minutes of rest. We're going to talk about your heart rate and stroke rate. So heart rate, whenever I, I talk about I'm just talking about percentages. Again, your maximum heart rate is going to be close to 220 minus your age. So 100% of a 30-year-old's heart rate is going to be 190, theoretically. And so then when you take 65% of that, you just multiply 190 times 0.65. And that's how I find my zone 3-ish percent. The issue that you're going to have with some athletes who have higher fitness levels than others is that you don't know specifics. And so the more elite of an athlete you become, and I'm talking like you're in A finals at the World Cups, you are starting to put the Olympics in your sight, and you are an elite athlete legitimately, you're going to want to go get VO2 max tested. You're going to want somebody to put a mask on you to measure your oxygen uh, intake, outtake, take blood lactate to see what you're producing, and then they're going to be able to tell you your max is 190. 
for sure. And then you're going to have such a more specific training regimen, and you're going to be able to improve a little bit more exactly. But if you're in a club level, you don't need that as much. You really just need to do every workout according to the workout. So that's why we have these different percentages. Zone one, your heart rate is going to be 35 to 45 percent of your max. Again, a walk in the park with your grandma or in the harbor, you're dock ducking. It's just dilly dally paddling. That means your stroke rate is going to be less than, I'd say, 60 strokes per minute. So uh, 60 stroke per minute. One second, one stroke. One 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000. So for zone one, you're less than that. And if you're a canoeer, it's not exactly half of that, but it's close. It's going to be more like a 20, a 20 to a 25 stroke. And sometimes that's even harder because you have to hold yourself in the air a lot more, but that's a technical thing for later. So zone two, 45 to 65% of your maximum heart rate. This, I want my kayakers to be at 60 strokes a minute. I want my canoers to be 28 to 30. This is a little bit more rhythmic, more under control. And you're working some, you're focusing on glide, but you're not heavily breathing yet. Zone three, you're going to be at 65 to 75% of your heart rate. And this is when you're going to be a little bit higher. I'm just going to put 70 stroke rate, 70 to 75. This is work. You're going to be trying to move the boat a lot per stroke. You're not dilly-dallying. You're maybe getting in a couple words a sentence if you're trying, but you shouldn't be talking during zone three. And then your stroke rate for a canoeer is going to be more 30 to 35 strokes a minute. Zone four. So again, this is the upper threshold. Your lactic acid is starting to build up because it's not getting to break into the other things. You have all the byproducts that we talked about. You are going to be working even harder, but you're not in max yet. You haven't stepped over the edge yet. You're going to be working 75 strokes a minute to 85. And as a canoeer, I'm going to say 35 to 40. Zone 5, you're 85% to 100% of your max heart rate. Again, this is so rough. Every single one of these percentages is going to be a little different for everybody. So you might say, that's not right, but it's just a range. And so 85%, you might hit. But if you're an older paddler or you're not that fit, you're not going to get all the way to up to your 100%. So um, your stroke rate, depending on your ability, this is your 90 to 130 strokes a minute for you kayakers. There's some of you that can actually sustain a good stroke above 120 strokes a minute which is impressive, and I'd be very impressed if any of our club paddlers could do that with good technique, but more likely you're going to be lower at 90. Right now, my zone 5 is probably around a 90. I'm out of shape. I'm not paddling and training it. For a canoeer, I'm hoping that this is closer to 60 or even 65. Some paddlers can get way up to 70. And so I, again, I'm saying this all the whole video because it's so important that these are ranges for a reason. So this is a huge range because your top level is going to be more than someone else's. I might be a little bit too conservative right here. Maybe you think you can hold a higher zone and still keep, or a higher stroke rate, but still keep within the zone percentage of your heart rate. It all depends on what stage you're at and your fitness level. These stroke rates are for a fit, in-shape athlete, somebody who's regularly paddling. But if you're just beginning, or maybe you're an older athlete, and so your heart rate's going to be a little bit more sensitive, the, it's really important to know your percentages. Say you're a paddler who just started in the boat, and you can barely stay in a lunge position for over a minute, then your heart rate is going to be so much higher. It's probably going to be up the 75% of your max heart rate but you're only paddling 20 strokes a minute. So you have to understand that I'm generalizing a lot of information here, but you have to know your max heart rate. You have to know where your percentages lie with stroke rates. So that's why it's important to use fun technical technology and gadgets like heart rate straps. So um, a lot of Garmin's, a lot of smart watches like I have right here, they monitor your pulse and your heart rate through a wrist, 
But when I'm paddling, I'm not, I'm not going to like look over and really see that. And it's not going to talk to me. So I wear a heart rate monitor around my chest and that helps me see if my watch is mounted in front of me, not just the workout and the time of the day and things like that, but also my heart rate, AKA my zone that I know because I'm a good athlete and I know my max heart rate. So every person is responsible to know and to be able to monitor if they want to have accurate practices and workouts and get better. So you got to work with your coach. You got to get the right equipment. You got to get the watch holder. You got to get the right watch for you. You don't need a super fancy Phoenix Garmin, which is thousands of dollars or whatever. You just need a watch that's going to give you the information that you need. So if you're just starting out and all you need is your heart rate, then get a heart rate monitor, use your Apple Watch or whatever it is. But as you get older, you might want to get a stroke rate counter and you might need a Bluetooth setting for that. So maybe a more expensive watch or gadget. But it's nice to have both your heart rate and your stroke rate so that you can really monitor not just your effort level for that day, but as an example, if you know practice after practice, this one workout, your heart rate's always at 75% of your max. And that workout calls for a 35 stroke rate as a canoeer. And then suddenly you do that same workout another week and you're doing 35 stroke rate, but suddenly your heart rate's at 85% or 90% of your max. That is a huge indicator for your coach and you to know, I might need some rest. I might need to take it back a little bit. I need to take a practice off because those are signs of being overtrained and things like that. And if you're just on a club level, it's very unlikely that you're getting there. But what I'm saying is there's tools for you to watch and monitor that, not just your effort level, which you should know internally, but also just your physiological happenings of what's going on inside. Another way to know if you're actually getting a little overtrained is your resting heart rate. So a really cool thing with these watches, if you wear them at night, you can watch on the app and look what your lowest heart rate was when you were sleeping. And that typically is a really accurate version of your resting heart rate. We've been talking this whole video about max heart rate. What about your lowest heart rate? That's an indicator of how fit you are as well. If you have a 60 beats per minute resting heart rate, pretty average. If you are a triathlete or a rower on the Olympic level, your heart rate's probably gonna be like 35 to 40. And so, it's a huge range of resting heart rate, but the point is to know it. So if you take your resting heart rate every single day for a week, take it at the exact same time of the day, so right when you wake up, you'll know what your average resting heart rate is. And then if one day you wake up and it's five, 10 beats higher than normal, hey coach, I think I'm getting really tired. My body is telling me because my, race, my resting heart rate is like five to 10 beats higher. So another really cool way to know how your body's doing with all of the training going on. So at Gig Harbor Canoe and Kayak, we have three groups. The third group is our developmental group. These are kids that are learning about our team, learning about how to carry boats well, how to paddle around the harbor safely, how to get into a, a racing kayak or a racing canoe. And they're learning about workouts, but they're really just having fun and learning. Group two are kids that wanna go to nationals. They're in a racing boat, they know how to work out, but they're learning how to train well. Group one is an app is a group for athletes that want to race internationally and that are very competitive at the national level and that they're learning how to race well. They already know how to train. They're using their knowledge and training to race at a high level. Expectations. When you get to group two, we want you to have a watch. We want you to know the workouts by heart, what you're doing that day. Group one is the highest level for us right now. And this is the athlete who's typically high school age and higher because of the demands of the sport and the physical and mental maturity it takes. Of course, you're going to need to know the workout ahead of time, but I expect you to have it in your watch. I expect you to have a GPS watch. I expect you to have your heart rate and your stroke rate easily available for reference. So if I say, hey, what stroke rate are you at? If I tell you, go to a 65 stroke rate, you need to know what that is and how to get there or if you're already there. You definitely should have water bottle. You definitely should have your resistance for if a resistance workout comes up. But if you don't know these zones, if you don't understand the energy systems, then definitely get with us coaches. Talk about it with us. Sometimes information doesn't come to other people as easily or it needs to happen in a different way. But in group one on our team, 
you're going to know what zones are and you're going to know what your max is. You're going to know your stroke rates. You're going to know how that relates to your racing plan and practice. If you have any more questions about training zones or energy systems or practices and workouts for yourself, don't be afraid to comment below. Make sure you like and subscribe as well, and we are happy to help you.